November 1953, a courtroom in Tehran. Dr. Mohammed Mossadegh, the man who put an end to British domination in Iran, is tried for treason. He is there because Britain and the United States have stage managed a coup d'etat to overthrow his government. Well, our policy was to get rid of Mossadegh as soon as possible. We didn't think he'd do any good to Iran. In the two years that he was there, it was, not, it was too long for our thinking, he did nothing for Iran. And don't forget that he opposed the British Empire before any, any other country in the Middle East had uh, risen against the British Empire. And he was called the man who broke the back of the British Empire and threw the British out of the country. Persia entered the 20th century in turmoil and decline. The former glories of its despotic rulers, the Shahs, had become an empty shell. Real power rested with two rival empires, to the north, the Russians, and to the south, the British in India, for whom Persia was a buffer state. Never formally part of the British Empire, Iran was more completely governed by British imperial priorities than were most colonies. The Iranians had somehow got it into their heads, perhaps for historical reasons, that they were not really running their own affairs, <clears throat> that whatever happened in Iran was done by somebody else, and they always thought that it was either done or not done by the British. Uh, erroneously, but one can see how they came to that uh, way of thinking. Il y avait beaucoup d'anecdotes qu'on faisait sur les Anglais. On disait que s'il y a le, la pluie, c'est parce que les Anglais l'ont voulu. S'il y a le, euh, tel type comme premier ministre, c'est les Anglais qui l'ont nommé. Même dans les différentes villes de l'Iran, s'il passait quelque chose, même s'il y avait un crime, on croyait que c'est les intrigues. Les intrigues des Anglais derrière ces, ces, ces crimes. In the Second World War, British troops, now allied with the Soviets, occupied Iran to run it for their wartime needs. They deposed the Shah, a dictator who had turned towards Hitler, and put on the peacock throne his 21-year-old son, Mohammad Reza Shah. When the war ended and Allied troops withdrew, Iranians demanded democratic reforms and sovereign control of their own country. In the vanguard was veteran Democrat, Dr. Mohammad Mossadegh. Mossadegh, I don't think that there has been in the last 50 years any, anybody more prestigious than Mossadegh in the history of the country. Why? For one thing, Mossadegh was incorruptible. The second thing was, he was against the power, always stood up to the power. And this started back in 1921, when he went against the coup d'etat government, and he almost lost his life. He was imprisoned, he was banished, then he was for some years in his house. And when, as soon as the Shah left and there was a free election, he was the first member of the, elected from Tehran. Iranian resentment at foreign domination focused on the country's greatest asset, oil. In 1909, a British company had obtained the monopoly for the extraction of oil from the fields of southern Iran. The oil was pumped to a refinery at Abadan. Here, the new black gold was boiled, barreled, and shipped away in the company's tankers. For Britain, the oil find came at the right time. With World War I approaching, 
Churchill, first Lord of the Admiralty, persuaded the government to buy a controlling share in Persian oil, so that the navy, newly converted to oil, could have secure supplies. Oil soon became the driving force of the industrialized world, filling not only petrol tanks, but the coffers of the company and the British Treasury itself. Cheap oil from Iran helped put Britain on four wheels. OK, Jim, come a ride up, boy. It was certainly nice to be able to say that again, and tens of thousands of British motorists took full advantage of the opportunity. Roads out of London, as in the case of other centres, were mostly as crowded as in the good old days before petrol rationing began ten years ago. By 1950, the Anglo-Iranian oil company was Britain's most profitable overseas investment. The dollar earnings of the refinery at Abadan were vital to keep the home economy afloat. For the British staff in charge in this sweltering climate, Abadan meant a truly colonial lifestyle. I had just been married, so um, it was the first year of my marriage. And I was married to Eric, who was the um, general manager. So we had a very beautiful house, and we did an enormous amount of entertaining. In fact, the first year of our married life, I didn't think we ever sat down to a meal on our own except breakfast. And we always had that in our veranda. I think most people had servants. Again, I think there were points allotted to your husband. Uh, the size of your bungalow, and how many coolers you had, and how many servants you had. The 70,000 Iranians employed by the company lived less well. Wages and welfare provisions were minimal. Conditions at Abadan were increasingly condemned. The company was accused of breaking its undertakings to the workforce. The immense majority vivaient dans ce que nous appelons en France des bidonvilles. Euh, alors, les conditions d'existence de ces ouvriers étaient absolument incroyables. Et surtout, on savait que l'Angleterre, c'est-à-dire la compagnie, gagnait de l'argent énormément. Il y avait deux groupes. Il y avait les Européens qui avaient tout et les Persiens qui n'avaient rien. Les Persiens ne pouvaient pas écrire la même bus que les Européens utilisaient à l'époque, ou entrer dans les clubs, ou dans les maisons, ou dans les facilités. Et ça les rendait plus angoissés que tout autre. Il y avait un wider feeling, peut-être, que les Français étaient plus angoissés que les Français. That uh, the oil company uh, interfered in uh, internal Iranian uh, political affairs, and that it had a wide network of uh, political connections uh, within the country itself. Iranians complained that Britain took nine times more revenue from the oil than Iran did. The mass of Iranians lived in grinding poverty. In the towns, there was a movement for change. The Iranian parliament, the Majlis, became the platform for a campaign to nationalize the oil company. For its leader, Mossadegh, this was the way to regain Iran's independence, a battle he had fought for 30 years. Now his moment had come. In April 1951, he became prime minister, but the British failed to take him seriously. He uh, appeared as a demagogue, not necessarily, it appeared to us at the time, in charge himself, but possibly being used by others. Uh, his uh, way of living and uh, general appearance didn't strike one as being the sort of uh, person you'd think of as a prime minister. And I don't mean them because he didn't wear striped trousers. In fact, he always wore pajamas. And that was a rather odd um, figure for a future prime minister to cut. At no time before a year or two, before 1951, did anyone contemplate that we would ever not stay there forever? We were there by an international agreement uh, between the government of Iran and the Anglo-Persian Oil Company. So there was no reason it should ever come to an end, as far as we could see. 
Tehran. Angry crowds surge through the capital of Iran, currently the world's number one danger zone. John Bull and Uncle Sam, too, are savagely caricatured. Extreme nationalists demand immediate seizure by their government of the half-billion-dollar Anglo-Iranian oil company. Focal point of Iranian unrest, however, is the government. Its cabinet headed by 70-year-old Premier Mohammad Mossadegh, whose single purpose is oil nationalization. He was a great actor, but he was a marvelous uh, politician, and at that time he had all the people with him. Everywhere you went, they would say, Zendiba, Dr. Mossadegh. Zendiba, Dr. Mohammed Mossadegh. Nahost Azir Mahbub Iran, which means long live Dr. Mossadegh, the beloved Prime Minister of Iran. And they didn't care much what he did. He clobbered the imperialists. He nationalized the oil company. Iran was a country again. It was great stuff. It was very moving. Uh, we would call him Dotty in some respects. But he wasn't in Persian eyes, and some of the very moderate Persian parliament, uh, parliamentarians would weep in the marshes when he spoke, even though they knew perfectly well that it was ruinous for their country and uh, impractical. The theme of propaganda of his partisans was to change the face of the world, at least the world Muslim world, by changing our relationship with the English. En mettant fin à la domination anglaise, nous arrivons à changer le visage, non seulement de notre pays, mais de, de l'ensemble. The atmosphere was uh, one of uh, complete joy, particularly as if it looked as if uh, there was really no conflict, no opposition within the country, as if the whole country had rallied and found the leader who was going to lead the country uh, towards best times. That was the atmosphere, the press, the newspapers, the radio, the uh, parliament, uh, they all uh, appeared to be united in these events. As the nationalization law went through, demonstrators tore down the company's nameplates. The British protested, and even sabotaged machinery as Mossadegh sent his men to Abadan to take over the refinery. The reception was extraordinary because there was a feeling that uh, now all the defects of the old regime which were in a word discrimination against iranians all those defects would be removed because all the administration of the of the industry would be in the hands of iranians so they had a wonderful reception on arrival there was no question of violent resistance but extraordinary how pieces of plant would go wrong uh, just when they were supposed to be doing something else you know and they soon realized that we weren't being very uh, helpful, really, and we weren't handing over files, we weren't handing over accounts, which they asked us for. I said I had no authority to hand them British companies' accounts unless I was told from London. Back in London, the Labour Foreign Secretary, Herbert Morrison, was devoting his time to the Festival of Britain, designed to boost national morale. But Labour's plans for welfare at home depended on profits from abroad. Morrison was determined to resist Iran's blow beneath the imperial belt. With the press right behind him, he denounced the Iranian act as illegal. To add weight to his words, the government sent the destroyer Mauritius to Abadan. London, where directors of the Anglo-Iranian oil company met to discuss the latest news from the Persian oil fields. The man bringing home the news was Mr. Drake, the company's general manager in Abadan. Later, Mr. Drake, at Mr. Attlee's invitation, went to number 10 to place before the cabinet a first-hand account of the present Persian drama. And I was wheeled into this cabinet meeting, where I understand the entire cabinet, except the minister responsible for oil, I don't know who he was now, uh, and the three chiefs of staff in uniform were all uh, seated round a table, the Prime Minister bid me take a seat on his right, between him and Mr. Morrison, the Foreign Secretary. And I pleaded uh, that we should not allow the biggest foreign asset in Britain to go without doing something about it. I didn't say particularly what was to be done. I had in my own mind that at least we should make a struggle for it. I thought it was a completely unilateral act. And I said that if we don't do anything about this, 
Within five years, we shall lose the Suez Canal on the same principle, which in fact proved to be exactly right almost to the day. The Labour government dispatched paratroops to the Mediterranean to stand by for an invasion of Abadan. This rang alarm bells in America. President Harry Truman was amazed at what he saw as trigger-happy irresponsibility. We had perhaps a different concept of the priorities involved. Our main desire was to be sure that Iran was saved for the free world. The illegal Communist Party of some 15,000 members conceivably could have taken over and ride the Soviets in. We, we thought that this should take precedence, saving Iran ahead of commercial considerations. The Americans thought the British attitude to the Mossadegh government was short-sighted. Mossadegh might not be ideal, but he might prove a useful ally against the Russians. He was expecting the Americans to help Iran by giving Iran necessary you know, equipment, uh, experts, and allow Iran to export its oil, including to American, um, uh, American purchases. And he thought that America would come to Iran's help because, you know, Americans had expressed sympathy on several occasions with nationalist movements in Iran. And also Henry Grady, who was the ambassador, American ambassador in Tehran, had uh, helped Mossadegh uh, personally and officially a great deal. I think the Americans had uh, been largely responsible for the early incitement almost to the Persians to uh, exchange this 100% British uh, ownership. I have to say that. The American ambassador was very thick with Mossadegh. The American ambassador in Tehran, Mr. Grady, recently paid a call on the Prime Minister to convey a letter from President Truman. It was a message urging Persia to negotiate with the British. Dr. Mossadegh, whose health is apparently not too good, transacts much of his business from his bed, and so it was on this occasion. A strange scene indeed, yet it would be hard to exaggerate the importance of the message or the problem to be solved. Since then, President Truman has sent Mr. Harriman to Persia to use his good offices in the dispute. I was afraid the British might bring in violence. Uh, they had a very strong feeling that a, they had a contract there. They were very literal in their consideration of the matter. There were contracts being changed, concessions on oil all over the world, and the British didn't give any consideration of that, which they should have. It was our asset and not theirs. It's very easy to be generous with somebody else's assets. Uh, they felt that uh, popular opinion in Iran needed to be uh, satisfied. Uh, they uh, were at some distance from the direct economic and financial consequences of what they, uh, what might be demanded. And so it was easier for them to have bright new ideas. It was for us to think of the consequences of them. They were very uh, arbitrary with the Iranians. They didn't show them the books. Uh, they paid them a very low royalty and uh, didn't give them any idea of what they were entitled to. They also imported Indian labor and the uh, Iranians were unemployed and that made them annoyed. Pressed by Truman's special envoy, the British reluctantly agreed to send a negotiator, Labour Minister Richard Stokes. Mossadegh used to come occasionally uh, in the evenings and have meals with us. We were out of doors, with caviar and servants, and um, we used to enjoy that. But most days, either Stokes and I would go and call on him. He lived in a very plain little villa. And uh, there he was, always beautifully dressed, uh, standing at the top of these stairs on his cane, receiving us. He was always very charming to me as a younger man, made a point of that. And uh, we never saw him, you know, this reputation he had of uh, appearing in grey pyjamas, bed as the sick man and so on. Never once seen that. Mossadegh said, well, you know what we want. We want to manage our own industry. And, but uh, we are perfectly willing to employ, to keep your employees. We are perfectly willing to have uh, an arrangement with you by which you will have all the oil that you need. But uh, we cannot have you as a concessionaire. They could never understand the whole problem of selling oil. We tried for, was it a fortnight? Must have been. To try and teach them, educate them, if you like, to the tanker problem. You, if you, it's no good expropriating oil if you can't 
sell it. You can't eat it. And all the tankers were owned by AOC. All the marketing arrangements, highly complex, were in their hands. Uh, all part of an international complex of marketing and uh, price adjustments and so on. And they could never understand it. I mean, most of the day, it was like, I mean, it was literally talking a dialogue of the deaf. Mossadegh believed that either Iran and the Iranians have to develop their oil or the oil can wait until there are enough Ir Iranians to develop it. He told me once that under no circumstances I am going to sign a treaty or an agreement with any foreigner or which in any way compromises the so sovereignty of my country. Sixty thousand Persians depend on the company for their living. If Abadan closes, there is no work for them. And Abadan must close if Persia holds up shipment of oil. A great organization will close down and ruin will come to Persia unless obstinacy gives place to reason. Newsreels reflected British interests. The loss of Abadan would mean losing not just cheap oil and profits, but putting at risk an international cartel in which the major oil companies controlled the market and fixed the price. With negotiations deadlocked, the company, still in control, shut down the refinery. Britain's tactic was confrontation. I think it was quite natural that the government should mobilize a force. British subjects, many of them, were there in Abadan, and it was useful to have a force there in case they had to be evacuated speedily. There was no doubt the hope also, not shared by everybody, but by some, that a show of force of that kind might bring um, sanity to what we thought was a situation which lacked it. Well, our view that this would have been a disaster, uh, and we told the British so in the strongest terms, to send a force in to reestablish an oil concession that you haven't been able to negotiate is just not done in, in the modern era, and we had reached that time. Now, we told the British not to, because we never thought they would. We always thought Morrison was bluffing. And he was. He, he made the show that he was going to do it if the technicians were removed. But when they were removed, nothing happened. They left quietly. Right up to the last moment, Bosadek did not want the British employees to leave. And he did everything in his power um, to keep them by assuring to them that they would receive the same treatment, if not better, as far as salaries were concerned, accommodation was concerned, all the conditions of employment. He wanted to keep them quite sincerely, and he kept on saying to the British, let us keep your employees as our employees. They said no. The last 300 British technicians are evacuated a day before the deadline set by the Iranian government. During the early days of the deadlock, British naval and paratroop forces were alerted in Iranian waters, but today the cruiser Mauritius serves as an evacuation vessel for the men who remained until the last minute during the bitter dispute. Meanwhile, Prime Minister Mossadegh was on his way to the United Nations in New York. The British, unable to use force, had complained that his nationalization endangered world peace. Mossadegh rejected the charge. C'est en vain que nous avons cherché ailleurs que dans les paroles des preuves que le royaume. And his object was to, I think, to uh, cause a split between us and the Americans and play on this Persian patriot, uh, sick man, and so on. And I think he rather made rings around us. Uh, uh, I don't think uh, 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 we came out best there. Not true, the Americans weren't taken in. They found him slightly ludicrous, but rather fascinating. He had a great impact on America because, don't forget, that the Americans, many, most of the Americans are anti-imperialism. And they like to talk to a man who has charisma. And Mossadegh had that charisma. He was an actor in, in politics. He, is, he had his own convictions. Yet in politics, he was an actor. The Americans still hoped they could bring Mossadegh round to a compromise with their allies, the British. Even the president lent his weight to the cause. There was no deal, but Mossadegh kept smiling. I profit of these last hours of my sojourn in the United States 
pour exprimer mes sincères remerciements envers la nation américaine qui m'a montré ses meilleurs sentiments ainsi qu'à ma, euh, qu ma collègue, qu'à mes collègues. Il faut changer. Mossadegh's enthusiastic reception in America only added to British anger. On his way home, he stopped in Egypt. Here, he received a hero's welcome from a nation equally determined to be rid of the British. But the British government was by no means reconciled to Mossadegh's triumph. They had a plan for revenge. At the end of 1951, Iran and its rich oil fields had never seemed so inhospitable to the British. The refinery at Abadan was in Iranian hands, and the Anglo-Iranian oil company had been banished. But the British had no intention of letting Iran sell what they saw as stolen oil. They imposed a total embargo. Anyone who bought oil from Abadan also bought a lawsuit from Britain. We were not prepared to see if we could possibly help it, Iran get away with an arbitrary act of nationalization without compensation and be able to sell oil. We wanted to show the world that they, you, you, they couldn't behave in this way. The embargo was part of a British plan to unseat Mossadegh and his government. Britain froze Iran's funds and cut off trade links. Mossadegh was dismissed as incompetent. We um, didn't think that there was any virtue in rewarding Mossadegh by giving him money. If you had rewarded him in that way, you'd have been perpetuating in power someone who was incapable of bringing any sort, form of stability or prosperity to Persia. For the reasons I've given, he could not govern. And the sooner then uh, that he left power, uh, the better for Persia. Not, not for us, for Persia. Behind the garden parties and the formalities, the British embassy in Tehran became the center of operations. Secret servicemen from MI6 were already installed. They aimed to bolster the opposition to Mossadegh in royalist circles and so strengthen the Shah's hand against his prime minister. Their most important Iranian agents were a family of wealthy merchants, the Rashidians, well known as friends of the British. Communications were maintained through embassy official Sam Fall. I started seeing the Rashidian brothers in March 1952 and this was a policy of our government and of the embassy in order to have a contingency plan in case the uh, negotiations didn't succeed. We were paying them a small amount of money. I don't know because I wasn't involved myself, but this was for passing a, a few demands to a likely lad paying the crowds. You can't do anything in Iran or anywhere else without money. The Rashidians, I believe, were the British net that was most totally controlled by the uh, MI6. These were true agents in the sense that they worked for the British government and knew they did. What made them very distinctive was that it was important for their type of operation that everyone in Iran would know this. Uh, therefore, when somebody wanted to run for parliament and wanted British help, uh, either straight help or financial help, everyone knew exactly where to go. Deputies expected to be bribed, I should think some of them, but they were certainly uh, helped to come to the right decision. Pray silence for the right honorable Winston Churchill, the prime minister. Yeah. The new conservative government endorsed all the policies of their Labour predecessors, and more. Results cannot be achieved by a, a wave of the wand. Yeah. Time is needed for a new administration to grasp and measure the facts which surround us in baffling and menacing array. They cast around for a candidate prepared to take Mossadegh's place and settle the oil dispute on Britain's terms. A lot more remedies coming. Yeah. The question was whether we could overturn the Mossadegh government. 
Um, I'd had a, a long association with Iran because of my father's connection with the country. And um, Iranians who were opposed to Mossadegh uh, kept on getting in touch with me. And um, one of these was the greatest elder statesman, Gavam Sultani. He was a very wily politician and an operator, and far more likely to um, manipulate the various parties in the Majlis and get a majority. He was a very, very professional, wily, um, and I don't say devious, but uh, elastic politician. And he was most likely to get a majority together. He got in touch with me several times and said he was prepared to do something about it if only the British government would give him their blessing. When he came and talked to me here about it, but um, the Labour government and even the Churchill government were a bit slow at first. The opportunity came in July 1952. Mossadegh unexpectedly resigned after crossing swords with the Shah over his powers as Prime Minister. Encouraged by the British, the Shah appointed Kavam. Tehran became paralyzed by mass protests demanding Mossadegh's return. The Shah and Kavam sent in the army. I was taken uh, out uh, by my brother uh, to the uh, area where the uh, main demonstrations were taking place. And uh, you could see uh, the running battle that was going on. Uh, between the people and the police and uh, the soldiers and uh, even tanks, uh, which I myself saw from a uh, fair distance, uh, and saw in fact one of them uh, shooting, one of the machine guns of the tanks shooting. And uh, the people were extremely determined uh, and uh, extremely angry. And each time they were being driven back into the little alleys, uh, they would surge back and try to uh, fight against soldiers and the policemen with the stones and cobbles that, were, that they were picking from the street. Some uh, uh, soldiers and officers uh, went over to the crowd and uh, decided not to shoot and were carried on the shoulders of uh, the demonstrators. Uh, and this was widely publicized and uh, celebrated. The shooting had left 45 dead and hundreds injured. But with the army's loyalty in doubt, the Shah and Kavam had to accept defeat. Mossadegh returned to office, promising a shake-up in Iran's corrupt and pro-British establishment. The popular reaction to the resignation of Mossadegh in Tehran was such that Kavam couldn't continue. This was a real setback. I think at the same time, the military takeover in Egypt was taking place, was it not? It was a bad, a bad week. The Kavam setback drove Britain to yet more devious means. Meanwhile, they continued talks on the oil dispute, knowing their demands were unacceptable to Mossadegh. We'd been um, sitting together at his bedside, iron bedside, for hours, and getting very heated about it all. And suddenly he rings a little bell, and in comes... Um, the servant with a great plate of sweetmeats. And he said, now to send the cameraman in. And I said, look, we're in the middle of a discussion, Prime Minister, is this the moment, really, for sweetmeats and photographers? He said, yes. Because sweetmeats will do you good, sugar's very good for you. The cameras, you know, it's an instinctive reaction of all human beings. When the camera comes in, they smile. And he said, we've got 50 cameramen, you'll have to do 50 smiles, then I'll kick him out, and we can resume, you'll be in a much better frame of mind. <laughs> of course, he's got something there. He really wasn't... He was a highly civilized person. The smiles were mere diplomacy. Back at the embassy, George Middleton wrote a cable to the Foreign Office. It was circulated in the cabinet. Mossadegh's megalomania is now verging on mental instability. It now looks as though the only thing to stop Persia falling into communist hands is a coup d'etat. The British looked for allies in the Iranian army until now controlled by the Shah. Mossadegh was determined to reduce the monarch's power. He took over from the Shah as Minister of Defense and retired leading royalist officers. From amongst this disaffected group, Middleton suggested one General Zahadi be recruited to lead a coup d'etat against Mossadegh. Ironically, Zahadi had been imprisoned by the British for pro-German sympathies during the war. 
and a British ambassador had once condemned him as vain, plausible, and thoroughly untrustworthy. Well, I, I went out to see him when he was living in his country estate, uh, and um, I used to go out partridge shooting, so if I had a gun with me, it looked all right. It looked like a terrorist act. It looked like a sporting occasion. And um, uh, changed cars three times at his request, and finally drove up to his country estate. He seemed tough. He wanted to be quite sure that the Shah was with him and the Americans. But he was very ill-disposed towards Mossadegh. He could see Mossadegh was leading the country to hell on a wheelbarrow. And he obviously liked the idea of power and all the perks that went with power. He wanted an assurance that money would start flowing, really without money to the Treasury. And we had talked quite openly at that time of uh, a line of credit or of 10 or 20 million pounds. It sounds like nothing in today's terms, but in those days it would have helped them quite a bit. With rumors circulating in Tehran, Mossadegh denounced the embassy as a nest of spies. In October 1952, he broke off relations with Britain and expelled all its diplomats. They could no longer mount their coup. In America, a new president had just been elected, Dwight D. Eisenhower. Could his Republican administration be persuaded to help? British Foreign Secretary Anthony Eden went to meet him, taking men from MI6 and the Foreign Office to consult the CIA. We went there, really, I would have said to persuade the Americans at that stage that we weren't going to get anywhere with Mossadegh and that his remaining in power was very dangerous to both our interests and also to tell them a little bit about the means we had at our disposal for changing the, changing the government. And we felt after we'd been talking for some time that they accepted that uh, Mossadegh remaining in power would eventually lead to a communist takeover. It was my feeling then, it remains my feeling, that the British understood the extent of, of paranoia in this country concerning uh, communism. This was the day of Joe McCarthy, and that the British consciously played on that fear in order to, to help persuade us to involve ourselves in the coup. Eisenhower appointed John Foster Dulles to take charge of foreign policy. To him, anti-communism and American big business were two sides of the same coin. One night at the Iranian embassy, the then ambassador Saleh and myself talked to John Foster Dulles. And John Foster Dulles made it very clear that Iran will not be allowed to get away with the nationalization. And his argument was that if we get let you get away, then what's going to happen to Kuwait, to Saudi Arabia, to Iraq, and all our American holdings all over the world. Encouraged by the response of the Americans, MI6 set up a team in Cyprus to keep in radio contact with the Rashidian brothers in Tehran. They had a very wide range of contacts, particularly in the bazaar, and the moneyed, or hopefully moneyed, classes were getting worried. They saw that their prosperity was being threatened, and opinion was building up among those classes against Mossadegh, and they also had contacts with the Ayatollahs and a sort of merchant religious movement going through to the people and a little bit of rent a crowd should have provided a strong popular demonstration against Mossadegh and in favor of the Shah. Central to the Rashidians network were the mob leaders based in the traditional athletic clubs where physical prowess and protection rackets went hand in hand. Here could be found men in the pay of Iran's ruling class who could provide the renter crowd the British needed. The British pinned their hopes above all on the Shah. To their dismay and that of Iran's elite, Mossadegh's reforms were reducing his powers to those of a ceremonial monarch rather than a ruler. The Shah was exceedingly weak. He was vacillating 
and he was afraid and he just didn't know what to do. He didn't like Mossadegh. He realized that Mossadegh was threatening his position, but he was unable to screw up the courage needed to dispose of Mossadegh. Although the Shah failed to act, the British kept trying. In March 1953, with Britain's agents fanning the flames, a hired mob called for Mossadegh's blood. Intrigues grew as the politics of the street took over and Mossadegh's supporters rallied to his defense. His moderate allies in parliament were now deserting him, but he was supported for the first time by the communist-backed two-day party, a development the CIA played on in their propaganda. What we did from Washington was to write some of the articles that would appear in the Persian press. And these articles would appear, thanks again to the Rashidians, who had contacts, I believe, with probably four-fifths of the Iranian press. And any article that I would write, it gave you something of a sense of power, would appear almost instantly uh, the next day in the Iranian press. And they were designed to show Mossadegh as a communist collaborator and as a fanatic, as a person who uh, didn't understand that you could be both nationalistic and positive. When weeping, fainting, bedridden old Mossadegh has trouble with the Majlis or Parliament, he goes to the people for a referendum to have it dissolved. But more than 100,000 citizens of Tehran, including every available member of the Communist Two-Day Party, turn out to vote yes and be marked with indelible ink so they won't vote again. Understandably, few oppose the skinny old man who controls the army and the police. And the supervisors at the opposition voting place have nothing to supervise. Mossadegh, who is not a communist, has won with communist support. Can he now get rid of his dangerous new friends? Meistens diese Menschen, die waren Demokraten, Antifaschisten, sagen wir Intellektuellen, auch die Offiziere von Partei, das heißt die Militärelemente, die in Organisation waren, die waren nicht davor, gegen Mossadegh zu putzen, weil sie im Endeffekt selbst Patrioten waren, Nationalisten waren. A certain number of people thought that he was becoming, he was leading Iran towards communism. That was, you know, the communist bogey which was uh, represented to the, to the United States and was the cause of the United States action in removing Mossadegh. I think that also was totally wrong. Mossadegh was not going towards co communism. Mossadegh had the two complexes. One was that he had a martyr complex, that if I die, I die for my country, or if I am jailed, I jail for my country, that's an honor. The second was that he depended so much on the people. He was a kind of the populist person that he said, people always will protect me. And as long as I have the people, nobody can have a coup d'etat against me. And I guess that was uh, the reason that he neglected everything. And even when the coup d'etat came, he didn't do anything about it. In August 1953, Britain and America were ready to act. The American ambassador was recalled to avoid implication. An American agent persuaded the Shah to sign this decree and arranged an army unit to deliver it to Mossadegh. The original coup plan was based on the, the fact that the Shah had the ability to dismiss a government. And therefore, what was going to take place was that an officer in the army would take a firman, a, a notice, to, the, to Mossadegh and inform him that he had been replaced and that General Zahedi would become Prime Minister. Le 25, à minuit, on a envoyé des chars et des mitrailleuses avec un officier, lequel était Nassiri, un colonel de la garde royale, signifiant à M. Mossadegh qu'il était démis. Alors Mossadegh a écrit sur l'enveloppe, reçu, je déciderai. Et il a donné ça. Alors quand on a vu des tanks, on ne vient pas tout de même à une heure du matin avec des tanks pour demander la, la démission d'un Premier ministre. Et encore, on n'a pas le droit de le demander. Mossadegh aurait dû agir immédiatement et faire fusiller le lendemain, par la loi martiale, tous ceux qui ont été inclus dans cette histoire. Quand la news de l'attempted coup was heard, Mossadegh's supporters took to the streets, venting their anger on symbols of royalty. The Shah himself fled the country. But the CIA did not give up. They looked for a way to turn the protests to their advantage. 
Dann gab es spontane Demonstrationen. An dem Nachmittag, dem 25. Morat, gab es natürlich eine große Demonstration in Zentrale, Platz, Teheran, Tupane. Eine große Demonstration, eine breiteste Demonstration der Tüte Partei. Natürlich die, die den Versuch des Amerika verurteilt haben, die den Bevölkerung aufgerufen haben, den Mossad zu verteidigen und diese nationale Regierung auf dem Macht zu behalten. Und äh, die haben für eine Republik sogar äh, sich ausgesprochen. Die haben die Parole des Volksrepublik ausgebrochen. Ne? Well, as soon as this occurred, these two agents that I mentioned saw the opportunity and sent the people we had under our control into the streets and acted as if they were too there. They were provocateurs, but we had more than, than just provocateurs. We had a lot of shock troops who actually acted as if they were two dead people throwing rocks at, uh, at mosques, at priests. With Tehran now in chaos, the CIA persuaded the Royalist army officers to try again. Brandishing copies of the Shah's decree, they advanced towards Mossadegh's house. Meanwhile, the Rashidians and their friends mobilized their mobs to do battle with Mossadegh's supporters. That mob that came into North Tehran and was decisive in the overthrow was a mercenary mob. It had no ideology. And that mob was paid for by American dollars. And the amount of money that was used is, it has to have been very large. There were lots of people in the streets, uh, standing on the pavements and wondering what was happening. There was a lot of, in fact, uh, talk and conversation and uh, debate, etc., as well as speculation. And uh, uh, I saw uh, a few uh, lorry loads of uh, people, uh, uh, people standing in these uh, lorries, looking like ruffians and thugs, uh, carrying clubs and sticks, and shouting slogans against Mossadegh and uh, occasionally in favor of the Shah. Uh, that was uh, what, what, what was happening in the morning. We didn't take it very seriously. We knew that there was something uh, wrong, but we thought perhaps that uh, things would uh, turn the other way. But in the afternoon, uh, it became clear that uh, things were much more serious, and the news came that Mossadegh's home had been sur surrounded. Gradually, uh, the shooting started, and I told him, sir, I think it's better you leave the house. He said, no, if it's going to happen, if it is going to be coup d'etat, I think it's better I stay in this room and I die in this room and I will never uh, live here. The battle at the house raged for several hours. Over a hundred lives were lost. The Tehran mob took their revenge by sacking and looting the prime minister's residence. Mossadegh surrendered. The coup had succeeded. Britain had got its revenge, and the newsreels gloated. General Zahidi, the new premier, emerges as the hero of the hour, for he it was who took charge of events and organized the movement that threw Mossadegh from power. The people showed their preference in no uncertain manner, and after nine hours of bloodshed, the forces of the Shah were in command, and Mossadegh's reign as virtual dictator of Iran had ended. The Shah had fled Iran in fear. Now he returned in triumph. While in public, the Shah held parades. Behind the scenes, he settled old scores, imprisoning and executing his opponents. Soon, he signed a deal with Western oil companies. But it was America, not Britain, that now called the tune in Iran. And the Anglo-Iranian oil company, renamed BP, had to share its former monopoly with American oil companies. Certainly BP didn't come out on top, but they, got, they came back with a, a major share in the international consortium, which was sub, subsequently set up. And I suppose from my own point of view, I'd have probably sat there for another 10 years in that appalling heat instead of doing some much more interesting jobs, which I was allotted to later. In the military court at Tehran, where he's been on trial for treason, the Persian ex-premier, Dr. Mossadegh, demonstrates that he knows how to make an entrance. Clad in his accustomed dressing gown and pajamas, he even makes a dramatic scene out of taking his place in the dock. What a performance! 
Britain and America had orchestrated the downfall of Iran's only democratic leader, a man of principle whom in other places Britain might well have welcomed as the successor to empire. The West wanted to misunderstand him. None of them is interested in Mossadegh as a person. They're all interested in him as the person who um, cancelled the oil concession. If they had wanted to understand him, I think a great deal could have been made for the future. As I said, the present situation in the Middle East might not have happened. Next week in End of Empire, Egypt. The book of the series is available from the ABC shop in your capital city.